Good morning. Please be seated. Dear, dear, dear guests, dear presidents, president of Wonka, Wonka Europe, and dear colleagues, um, I think this is one of the most interesting time right now. We are having three keynote speakers in this session, and together with my colleague Katarzyna, she's the president elect of Pascu de Gama. Yes, and with my colleague, who is the president-elect of Wonka Europe, Mehmet. We will try to help and facilitate this session together. On my left side, you, you know this blonde lady. She is our president in Europe currently. She's a very good friend of mine also. We have started the Wonka Europe meeting eight years ago here in Krakow. It's also a celebration of working together with her. And it's a pleasure to introduce Anna Staudan, who's living in Oslo as a family physician, actively and very actively. At the same time, she has been teaching in the university uh, to the students and also the postgraduate trainings of the general practice. And she has been many, many specifications, uh, like being the first uh, president of the Nordic Federation of General Practice, and the also um, past presidents of the College of General Practice in Norway. Nor Norway. And I think since 2016, she has been running the presidentship of Wonka Europe. The keynote topic is the gender role shift and the implications for family medicine. Anna's talk will shed light on how the shift in the gender mix in our workforce is changing European family medicine. Please, Anna. Good morning. Will I have my presentation? Still not? Waiting while people are entering, still entering. There we are. Thank you for the nice introduction and for giving me this opportunity. I can tell you gender, this topic, struck me immediately when I was asked to give this keynote. Many months before the Me Too movement occupied public debate last autumn. Gender has interested me as long as I can remember. Let me share with you some particularities of my background. I'm privileged and grateful for having been born, raised and trained in modern Norway. My mother, a high school teacher, a modern woman, ahead of her times. She was the breadwinner in our family, allowing my father to pursue his career as a researcher, pioneering the novel field of sociology in our university. In 1969, he was granted a sabbatical, and our family spent four months in the US. There, with the alert senses of a 10-year-old, I witnessed ringside the manifestations of the civil rights the anti-Vietnam War and the looming women's liberation movements. These strong impressions are still vivid and they unraveled and unfolded as I prepared this speech. During my sociology studies following my high school years, I was able to process and organize these impressions in an analytic framework. Combined with my experiences as a young woman, 
the importance of sex and gender as a strong social determinant was established and reinforced. It was in this period of my life that I came across this quote by Oscar Wilde for the first time, and I reflected a lot on what the different meanings of sex could be. The biological sex, the activity, or both. The acclaimed and plagued writer certainly had his own reasons and experiences to reflect on these matters, and the quote still resonates with me. Later, in 1981, I entered medical school as part of a 30% female student body. In 2018, the ratio is 75 to 25 in favor of women. I have witnessed the changing composition of our workforce with the massive influx of women, both through my work as a family doctor, as a teacher of medical students, and as a supervisor in our family medicine training program. And during the same period, since the beginning of the 1970s, the Norwegian welfare state expanded. A great number of rights and regulations were introduced, in some fields guaranteeing more or less mathematically calculated equal rights for men and women. This has left us as one of the world's most gender equal societies in terms of pay, access to education and political representation. And last, but far from least, I'm privileged having raised a son and a daughter, followed them through childhood into adulthood, observing how they cope and deal with adapting to their gender, preparing for the future role in society. What has all this got to do with family medicine? Throughout my 30 years working in the field, I kept observing, reflecting, and wondering how sex and gender has a major impact on the performance and behavior of the doctor, as well as of other patients. And for clarification, I will use gender as meaning male versus female, albeit fully aware that the concept of gender in reality is much more complex. This simplification is necessary, not least owing to the nature of the research literature. The good intentions and regulations in the welfare state is reflected and duly addressed also by Wonka. It is even encapsulated in the European definition of our specialty, here illustrated by the Wonka tree. And in the definition it said, general practitioners are personal doctors primarily responsible for the provision of comprehensive and continuing care to every individual seeking medical care irrespective of sex and illness, age, sex, and illness. An important reminder, a reminder in a culturally diverse Europe, also regarding gender-related issues. Gender is also addressed in the Wonka Europe bylaws. We say that the uh, organization, uh, the objective shall be achieved by promulgating the pivotal role of gender as a determinator of health promoting the equitable inclusion and advancement of women general practitioners and family physicians. So, what's my concern? Colleagues, I don't think the importance of sex and gender has been adequately taken into account when we discuss the composition of the workforce. I don't think it has had adequate bearing on the teaching in our curriculum on our research. And I think that as family doctors, we are dragging our feet as we seem to ne neglect, even to reflect sufficiently on the clinical consequences of the research already available. I am afraid that we have become complacent, believing that the gender-related issues already are taken care of by bylaws, regulations, and legislation. Mission completed, so to say. But I've experienced more than once that we find gender-related issues slightly un uncomfortable to deal with because we fear that it might lead to fronts instead of unity. So it's my ambition to show you that sex and the gender issue is highly important in family medicine. Let's look at it from both sides now, from the patient's view as well as from the doctor's, and starting with the latter. And why not start with money? how the gender composition of the workforce, frankly speaking, more or less, seems to determine the socioeconomic status of our profession. 
Family medicine is actually what we're doing for a living. Women are like men, only cheaper. The gender pay gap seems to be universal, but you might be surprised to learn that the gap is even wider for doctors than in many other professions. This slide shows that in UK the gap is 34 for doctors against 18 for pharmacists and 12 for lawyers. I think there is a general worry, and understandably so, that the female influx into our profession may lead to declining salaries. An increasing pay gap seems to be an unavoidable consequence of a gender shift. And we seem to accept it, almost like a law of nature. Why is the important role of performing person-centered medicine balanced against the role as gatekeeper, less estimated and remunerated when performed by women and by men? And how come we are making so little fuss about it? I'm well aware of the female dominance in family medicine being a greater worry in the Western than in Eastern Europe, where family medicine historically has been and still is a woman's trade with low pay and low status. However, the issue of remuneration has to be dealt with through negotiations and battles on the appropriate, appropriate arenas. We most certainly have a strong case for it, important for family doctors of all genders all over our continent. Now let's move to clinical practice. Clinical practice. Social psychology has provided us with strong evidence from non-clinical studies that compared to men, women have been shown to be more emotionally expressive, more skilled in non-verbal communication, more interested in people, more status leveling, more likely to display positivity, and more likely to engage in active listening. You will recognize these virtues as main elements in communication skills necessary for a person-centered approach, the golden standard of family medicine. Judith Hall, a social psychologist at Northwestern University in Boston, focuses her research on verbal and nonverbal behavior of physicians and patients with focus on gender differences and correlates of patients' outcomes, such as satisfaction and adherence to medical regimens. Here are some of her conclusions. Patients respond inconsistently, probably ambivalently, ambivalently to male versus female physicians. And high verbal patient-centered behavior by female physicians is not recognized as a marker of clinical competence as it is for male physicians, but is rather seen as expected female behavior. This might provide the female doctor with a positive point of departure and positive expectations never hurt, but at the same time leaving her with the risk of a greater fall if ex expectations aren't met. Patients read more dominance into female physicians' behaviors than that of male. Examples, male speaking more was not associated with greater perceived dominance, but female speaking more was. Same for lo loud voice, not looking at the patient, not smiling, not back channeling. Furthermore, patients did not like more dominant female physicians. The good question is how these gender-specific char characteristics play out in decision-making during the consultation. In our clinical work, decisions are always based on the varying degrees of clinical insecurity. So, decision-making skills, are equally important to communication skills. Let me introduce you to the results of a Norwegian research project with great relevance to our topic, conducted by Unirin a researcher at the Arctic University of Tromsø. The central question, as we know, and the dilemma for the family doctor in clinical setting is often refer or contain. Ringbar finds that female GPs referred with significantly higher frequency to specialist services than male GPs. What is the explanation? We can only speculate. Does it have to do with default gender behavior in the interaction between patient and doctor? Female doctors lacking adequate courage to withstand patients' expectations and demands? 
Can the Lingborg's findings be in line with what Judith Hall has found, that patients are more likely to sanction dominant female physicians than males? Dominance here meaning to say no, based on sound medical reasoning to the patient asking for referral. And, or, are male doctors more liable to cut, cut corners and take chances, relying from male experience that sanctions are few and far between, no matter what? I wonder if female physicians should be challenged to stand their medical ground and not fall back to default gender behavior, to choose peace instead of dissatisfaction, putting their medical professionalism in the balance. My own, practice, my own experience from clinical practice and teaching tells me that this is worth while reflecting on. More on gatekeeping and gender difference. In my country, family doctors are authorized and allocated the role to issue sick leave notes, another important part of the gatekeeper role in Norway, as it is issued on the first day the patient needs a sick leave. The criteria for eligibility is spelled out in detail, but still doctors' behaviors is far from uniform. Another fact important here regarding sick leave is that female, female employees call in sick significantly more than males. This study, and the article here is in Norwegian, um, uh, it shows that if you are looking for a sick leave note, your chance of obtaining it is about 2.5% slimmer if your doctor happened to be a female, and she is more liable to leave you with a part-time sick leave instead of a full. How can we understand this gendered state of affairs? Does female doctors have high expectations to their own performance in multitasking professional duties and taking care of their families, and hence set the bars high also on behalf of others? In this field, female physicians show decision-making power, and they are behaving more in line with regulations and guidelines. But this behavior is also leaving them less exposed and liable to think Sorry, in this field, female phys uh, physicians show decision-making power, and they are more behaving more in line with regulations than men. Um, but this behavior is also leaving them less, less exposed and liable to finger-pointing from their superiors. It's important for me to assure you, I'm not taking the role of the warrior here, this, describing gender stereotypes in order to put up fronts. But I am a crusader for pointing out the importance of being beware and recognize gendered behavior in family medicine. That brings me to the issue of the composition of the workplace. In what way might gender composition of the team have an influence on the outcome and on the quality of the performance? Sarah Fisher Ellison from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology set out to measure two potential effects of gender diversity in the work workplace on social capital and on performance. Although employees in offices with a workforce composition closer to all female or all male reported to be happier and having higher morale and cooperativeness, an interesting finding in itself, they were found to be less productive. The researchers found that changing the composition of the workforce to a 50-50 gender split could result in a 41% increase in revenue. Is diversity in gender correlated with diversity in other dimensions, like ideas, skills, interests? I can't see any reason why this phenomenon shouldn't be relevant also in the primary healthcare team. Now, enough about doctors, at least for now. Is disease and illness gendered? Of course it is. One classical example is to be found in cardiology. A greater awareness of the differences in presentation of uh, angina pectoris and ACS between men and women with gender-based interpretation of diagnostic tests is mandatory for healthcare professionals to improve therapeutic strategies and outcomes in women. This is an established fact, and there is a general consensus of its importance based on traditional biomedical research. 
and a good example of how biological sex plays a role in diagnosing. Things get more complicated in the field of child and adolescent psychiatry. We are all familiar with the trend of increasing, yet most gender imbalanced, prevalence of attention deficit disorder. This slide shows the prevalence of ADHD in 10 European countries, with a male-female ratio varying from 3 to 1 to 16 to 1, with an average ratio of 5 to 1 in favour of males. It doesn't stand to reason that boys in neighbouring countries are so different merely due to biological sex. There needs to be a footprint of social adaptation as well, in society in general and in medicine in particular. Family doctors are the point of first contact to healthcare. It is often with us worried parents for the first time discuss signs or symptoms that may be some, sometimes too easily, especially if referred, are summarized to fit an ADHD or related label. Are we in fact doing the young man a great disservice by allocating him with the ADHD label that easily, even medicalizing him because he's a bit out of the ordinary wild and disorganized as he is trying to come to terms with his own inherited masculinity? Are we at risk of disturbing his natural inherited trajectory towards his own manhood as we are aiming to forge and gorge him in to fit into an even narrower range of accepted normality? We need to reflect on this. You have probably heard of the incredible act of terror taking place in my country in July 2011 when a bomb detonated in our national political centre, killed seven people and 69 young Labour Party, Labour Party activists were shot dead at their summer camp. 325 survivors have been followed up during the following years. Researchers have compared the rate of P PTSD in this group to the Norwegian population in the same age group and found that persons from minority ethnic groups and females had significantly higher rates than males of Norwegian ethnicity. I will concentrate on the gender issue. The respondents were asked to which degree and why they had refrained from seeking help or support. Near three out of four female participants reported that they, to some degree, had refrained from seeking social support due to assumptions that their problems were of little or no importance, which was sig significantly different from male survivors. A surprising result for me, I must confess. The researchers suggest that we should not only explore perceived so social support among traumatized traumatized patients, but also barriers to making use of these. Indirectly, the researchers offer an entrance into a deeper understanding of the known gender difference concerning mental health problems in women and men. Given the global sociocultural practice of socializing girls to appraise others' needs over our own, and that females females globally are more exposed to concealed trauma, we may here have unexplored sources of known asymmetric disease distribution, resulting from social practice. I can understand if you find this example from the Terror Act uncomfortable, maybe even irrelevant, because the event was so extreme. But we can use it as a magnifying glass, agreeing that the principal considerations may be of general value. So let's speak a bit more about barriers. Family doctors represent our patient's first point of contact with health service. But if we are a bit more specific regarding first contact, in most settings, the first person to meet the patient ahead of our consultation is a woman. Could it be that this gender dominance, both in the front line and now increasingly thereafter, represents a barrier to the male patient, especially when he is in need of help with problems associated with his masculinity? 
when he is stuck in fear of failing to meet own and society's expectations as a male. We do know that males around puberty and in old age are the most vulnerable if we look at well-documented suicide statistics. Sorry. I have a quote for you now, which is not on this slide. Um, so don't look at the slide, because then you will get uh, confused. Just listen to what I say. An exercise. An exercise. It's a reflection published in the Lancet Psychiatry two years ago. It says, the role of sex and gender clearly needs to be acknowledged, and researchers should also be aware of their own preconceptions and how these might affect both the scientific questions they ask and their interpretation of the data they collect. I'm convinced that we need to take these considerations into account in all clinical fields, and we could also easily exchange the word researcher with clinician and scientific with clinical, and it would be just as true. Now we come to this cartoon, because we will move to another gendered field in family medicine, where considerations, or so to say all kinds, needs to be taken. The medically unexplained physical symptoms. The patient in this cartoon offers the doctor a piece of advice. I thought it might be uh, help if I listed my symptoms. A good start. The prevalence of this condition is increasing, not because it is new, but it hasn't been labelled like this until recently. So MUPS is a female condition, first of all, and the list of symptoms tend to make the doctor feel helpless. Medical education and training have, to little extent, provided the doctor with the tools and language to understand and interpret the patient's symptoms. The medical frame of reference often proves to be insufficient even irrelevant. We need to encapsulate a broad range of elements in our approach, like the consequences of the biological sex and the physical implications of pregnancy and childbirth, the gender role in society, often with double workload, the epidemiology of the gendered frequency of concealed trauma and possible consequences for health and well-being. However, body talk. Life's expression through body symptoms is not specific for the female, female gender. Could it be that the male equivalent of MUPS just expresses itself through other gender-specific symptoms? As I have come of age and gathered experience in my own practice, it strikes me that an increasing lot of men, irrespectively of, uh, uh, irrespectively of barriers, venture to my office with their male-specific symptoms and worries, afraid of falling behind own and partners or society's expectations, presenting especially sexually related symptoms, loss of libido, erectile dysfunction and the likes, with no pure biological explanation to be found. So, just like we do when we diagnose and treat organ-specific symptoms, we must try to think globally and look through our gender-sensitive glasses in order not to miss out on important details. That, that, that's where the quote was, but I will uh, keep on. And before I end this talk, I will spend a few minutes on technology and gender. What impact might the reproduction industry have on gender in medicine? As we witness sperms, eggs and embryos for sale and uterus for hire. A growing global flourishing industry, adapting, cutting corners or even turning a blind eye to legal regulations and ethical barriers, always finding ways and means of doing its trade, irrespective of the customer's age, sex, gender, singular, couple, male, female, homosexual, lesbian, transgender, or any combination. What implications of this development will we experience for family structures, cultural changes, determinants for health and risk intervention, recognition of disease patterns? 
Meeting the individual, the family, in their context, that's our mandate. And in diagnosing and treating, pattern recognition is our main tool. We will need to develop new knowledge and analytic approaches to relate to this development. And recognize its changes and understanding our own times, and not least recognizing our own attitudes and prejudice, our prerequisites to fulfill this, our task. I'm struggling with a paradox in this virtually explosive development. On one side, we are medicalizing any characteristic falling short of an ever narrower definition of normality. And we are doing so in the name of risk management and prevention of future disease. On the other side, we are manipulating characteristics inherited through our chromosomes and genes, and thereby, thereby blurring the boundaries used defining sex and gender. That's our reality now. Let me sum up introducing and implementing laws and regulations, even when backed by sanctions, is not adequate to secure real equity and equality between genders. The Me Too movement may represent a wake-up call, a wake-up call from a complacency and acceptancy state of affairs having developed in the shadow of formal regulations. But as family doctors, we have to dig deeper to explore and understand the dynamics between the genders and in how gender plays out in the patient-doctor relationship is much more constructive than being defensive about it. We need to reflect, explore and discuss how illness and disease and their manifestations are gendered. Then use our insight to serve both, or should I add, all kinds of genders with high quality family medicine. I hope I made it clear that I'm all for a sound gender balance within our profession. I love to dance, I fancy tango, and although not an expert, I proclaim with suffisance, it takes two to tango. So to all males in the audience and within our profession, come dance with us. Thank you for your attention.